Welcome to the Contemplative Science Podcast. My name is Jamie, and as always, I'm joined by co-host Dr. Mark Miller. Mark, how are you, man? Hey, James. How's it going? I'm doing great, thanks. Um, today, we're lucky enough to be welcoming Dr. Sarah Stromer onto the show. Sarah is a psychology lecturer and mindfulness researcher at Canterbury Christchurch University. She's got a particular interest in dose when it comes to mindfulness, and we're really excited to have her on. Sarah, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Hello. Um, to kick off, I'm interested in how you came to study dose in mindfulness in the first instance, um, because it's a fairly niche area of research, despite being so important. Absolutely, I agree. Um, so when I first started um, with mindfulness, I worked as a research associate in a uh, applied psychology institute in, in the UK, so it's um, mostly clinical, but also other applied psychologies. Um, and as part of that, we had a uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapist who uh, just did like a, a eight-week MBCT program for staff to just sort of help with, you know, everyday stress, you know, uh, give, give like a taster sort of of what mindfulness is all about, things like that. So I got, uh, went along to, to that, um, and that's an eight-week program. Like I said, it's fairly intense, so it has uh, two and a half to three hour weekly group sessions then you have um home practices that you do these are like 40 minutes to up to an hour a day um that, that you're doing um and it goes for eight weeks and then there's a retreat as well so i really enjoyed that but i found it quite intense as well so i was working full time as you know you're doing an hour of home practice every day so that that seems quite intense to fit in every day i thought for myself um, but I really, really enjoyed the mindfulness aspect of it and had sort of done some of it similar to in my master's already. Um, so what I was um, doing, uh, what I did afterwards is at Monash, there's the Future Learn course on uh, mindfulness for well-being and peak performance, which is like an online uh, course. Um, and I did that one because I really enjoyed it and it had sort of lower practices. So there were maybe 10 minute practices. There are some sort of uh, reading materials, things like that as well, but much, much shorter practices than the, the 40, 50 uh, hour long practices. And um, that really interested me to, to see because I found benefits in the, in the lower practices a, a lot. Uh, and I thought, what is the difference? You know, what, there are so many different programs available on mindfulness. You know, these, these eight week programs, longer than eight week programs, then there's apps, there's online programs, there's um, self-help book-based bibliotherapy programs and I kind of thought well what is what is the best one what is the relationship what is the dose that you need to do um, you know both in clinical populations but also general populations because people have you know responsibilities they have work they have dinner to cook other things to do you know how do you how do you know um, and I was kind of interested um, and then I did my PhD on that to to answer that question uh, basically yeah yeah, that's that's great. You know, we talk about this a lot, actually, um, that contemplative practices are always sort of optimal within a certain bandwidth. Um, but we haven't spoken about dose. But I mean, it makes sense because I think there's a kind of it seems for me anyway, there can be a sort of uh, a thought in the contemplative communities that sort of more is better. Um, you know, you want to be continually growing the amount and somehow if you can really sit down for a few hours a day then that's much better than a shorter period of time but we've had this conversation again and again it seems in the recent weeks that that mm -hmm. thinking about that in a sort of linear in too much of a linear way is probably problematic you know that yeah. it's probably good there's going to be a balance there's going to be a right a right amount of practice somewhere in the middle that's going to be different for people so we've been really we've been really hot to have you on to talk about this idea of dose mm, yeah I think um, that that's a re that's a really good point as well, um, and what you're saying uh, that there, Mark, about how people start practicing, because because I mean there's 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 a lot of mindfulness research out there now, but also the question is about how people start, and and sometimes um, telling someone that's what I've come across in, in research anyway, telling someone to start in uh, forty minute practices or fifty minute practices when they first sit down is quite. It's quite long, you know, <laughs> sitting still for that long is, is quite tricky for some people, for other people it might be easier, you know, they f might find that quite helpful. Um, a metaphor that I use quite a lot is um, imagine someone uh, who wants to run a marathon, right? So they're sort of the first time they're put on their running shoes. You wouldn't expect them to run 42 kilometers or 26 no. miles, no, would exactly. you? So you'd like slowly build it up. No. Maybe they go for a walk first. Maybe they run one kilometer, maybe five kilometers, maybe 10 kilometers, and then slowly build that up to be able to run a marathon. Also, the other thing yep. is as well, um, for, for running marathons, not everyone wants to do that 
you know, some people might just keep it at 5K and then that's fine. Um, and you still have health benefits, uh, things like that. You don't have to go to the Olympics and compete, things like that. Um, and it's similar in mindfulness practice as well. There's a lot of benefits being found in shorter but regular mindfulness practices as well. And if that works for someone, why not have that work for some people and then for other people, longer practices? Because, you know, two things can be true for, for people, I think, as well. Yeah, and one of the interesting things when we talk about mindfulness and dose is that we have a little bit of a job on our hands just to establish what an ideal outcome is, mm. right? Because we talk about dose and the implication is that a certain dose refers to a certain outcome. How do you even go about establishing what a good outcome is, especially given the caveat that we're all different psychologically? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so there's different, as you say, different outcomes, different things that you can measure as psychologists. So there's, there's things like... Um, psychological well-being that you often measure through sort of self-report measures and things like that where you can see generally um, how how someone's doing in their everyday life you know there's clinical measures there's non-clinical measures um, you know general well-being measures uh, things like that uh, there's a bit of a caveat on that um, in, and then obviously there's brain scans and things like that as well so there's there's different things we've got available um, there's differences in in what that means as well and how you can say is that good or bad you know for some some people that might be different um, as, as you say uh, so often what you do is is look at what someone's baseline is and control for that so so before they do the mindfulness practice complete some measures and then you can see you know what what is their normal you know thing does it does it improve does it change does it not change um, things like that as well um, psychology, I think, is, is tricky uh, also because self-report measures, you know, there's, there's always going to be some degree of bias in them because people complete them themselves. Um, it's interestingly, um, I had a, a reviewer recently, though, that said to me, who else can tell someone how they're feeling than the person themselves? You know, you can't really say that. Like, yeah. Oh, this person looks like they're happy. No. They must be happy. You know, that, no. that's another thing. That's super challenging. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what kind of measures are you uh, most interested in when you're thinking about dose in your research? I mean, what are you looking at that improves? Do you have a sort of subset of things that you're interested in improving in particular? Yeah, so I think my uh, main area that, that I'm interested in is, is, is well-being measures. Uh, so things like um, people's depression, anxiety and stress levels, not just on a clinical level, but also sort of everyday people, you know, everyone's stressed sometimes or, or feeling down or worried about things as well. Um, and and sort of how, how mindfulness can help with that um, as well. Um, on the other hand, also some some brain related measures could also be interesting, although that is much more tricky with the dose question, um, because you don't because because for instance there there's some research that has been completed about um, really high level dose experienced uh, practitioners who've been practicing a, 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 at a high dose for for you know twenty thirty years several decades, and um, often what what that means though you can see what their brain looks like compared to people who aren't experienced meditators right but you don't know what their brain looked like when they first started no, we, right we have no first know. picture do we yeah. so we don't really know yeah, so yeah that's a little bit more tricky to do yeah it's interesting too because um when we talk about mindfulness we assume and we've, we've just touched on this we assume the bigger the dose the better because the gym analogy serves here. We just go, well, if you go to the gym lots of times, the evidence is you get more benefits. But, you know, just before we got on air, me and Mark were chatting. And I said, my dad, who's in theory quite eccentric, said, well, I want to do exercise, but I'm 68 years old. I want to do the least amount for the most amount of benefit. So I read this paper and got an exercise bike to do three minutes of intense exercise a week on the basis that that captured most of the curve for cardiovascular health. Mm -hmm. um, and the irony was he stopped because it was too much work. But <laughs> even though, That's great, I love which, that. Which is, ridiculous, which is beyond ridiculous, but there's a wider <laughs> point there, which is like, is it possible that our assumption about mindfulness isn't so correct when it comes to the benefits and the dose? Yeah, I think it's, it's really, really interesting because at first, this is not what I expected to find either with the, with the maybe starting small might be helpful. But then I talked to some different people, um, some Buddhists as well, so at conferences, and I heard Sharon Salzberg, who's a big mindfulness researcher in the field mm -hmm. as well, saying something about that, that actually starting small is quite normal, what they do in Buddhism as well. I also saw um, you had Dzana Dorji on there. She's done a, some research on that or, or 
said that is in traditions as well, starting five, ten minutes. Now, in Buddhism, for instance, there's sometimes younger people, so children that start with these shorter practices, for instance, often, oftentimes. But then building that up as well. So, so that's quite, it's not that surprising if, if thinking about it a little bit more when I've spoken to people and they said, yeah, actually, that is quite, that makes sense, starting with these short practices. Um, and I think also it makes things more accessible um, as well because in, in research it, it, it was found people, you know, are recommended to do some mindfulness practices, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. Um, and a lot of the time people didn't um, differ in the amount of practice they actually did. So people who were told to do 10 minutes did just as much as much as people who were told to do 20 minutes. And there's actually no difference. But then the people that were told do 20 minutes and they only did 10 minutes, they might feel a bit more guilty or they have done it wrong. And then that comes in uh, as well and might not be good for their psychological well-being in that sense. So. This is the really interesting thing about saying, well, there are different options of dose because there are only options that this doesn't happen in isolation. This happens in the context of your life. So it's almost on one level silly to speak about doing an hour a day versus 10 minutes a day. If an hour a day is unsustainable given the life of the practi practitioner, it's a false equiv equivalence. And there's the additional benefit beyond just the fact that you might be able to get some of the benefit of the practice with less time. There's just this point to be made that this doesn't happen in isolation. And therefore we're interacting and interfacing with our psychology all the time around what is doing quite a difficult thing to sit there and eyes closed and breathing. Yeah. And we miss that point so often when it comes to this conversation that like none of it counts unless we're doing it. Yes. And this is exactly that's exactly what you, what you were doing there, you know, shifting in your seat, things like that. I had that exact thing with one of my participants where in one of my studies where I compared five minute mindfulness practices to 20 minute mindfulness practices. And one participant in the 20 minute group found it really hard. And she said, isn't there a shorter option? She said, uh, I can't sit still for that long. And she was shifting in her seat and she found it really, really difficult. And for that person, you know, there's other types of mindfulness practices available. So things like walking meditations are quite helpful for some people where, you know, you're walking, um, and you're feeling your feet on the floor, you, you feel the wind in your hair, things like that as well. Um, and mindfully paying attention to, to that. So for, for the, here's the individual differences thing again. So for some people, 20, 40, 50 minutes, two hours might not be a problem that, that they might be really, really helpful for these people. But other people, it might not be. And I think that's okay. You know, different things can be helpful for different people. Um, and then there's also things like um, in informal mindfulness practices, like, you know, mindfully brushing your teeth, mindfully doing the dishes, mindfully, um, you know, sitting down, drinking a cup of tea, things like that, uh, or coffee or, or whatever. Um, so that, that can be really helpful as well. So, so just paying attention to what you're doing in the moment. Um, it doesn't have to be something really complicated. You don't need a sp um, special cushion or something um, in order to have some benefits for mindfulness as well. So I think, I think people who are listening today um, are going to, I think it's easy to buy into the fact that slow and progressive is a good way to train. I think that's, I think that's, I think, I think we can all buy into that, you know, that start small, start slow, grow slow. I mean, actually, even though, even though I'm saying that, um, as a meditation teacher, I find myself saying this a lot. So, I mean, it must not be so obvious that, uh, you know, just like you wouldn't go to the gym and try to lift like mega weight all the time from nothing. But people are so quick to do that with their minds, actually. Like, oh, it's no big deal. I'll just try to do, especially very, like, I, I'm a recovering type A personality, you know? And, like, uh, it's easy to be like, oh, I love meditation. Wow, I had a breakthrough. So now I'm going to do three hours a day from now on um, is, I think, completely ridiculous. So you, you want to do it slowly and you want to grow up. So that's good. But what I'm really interested in is, have you found evidence... Uh, this is the part that I think is a little less intuitive. What have you found for like the benefits of shorter practices? I mean, are, are you finding like, just like Jamie's dad found, you know, this research that even three minutes catches most of the benefits when it comes to cardiovascular health. Is there similar sorts of things like that um, that you're finding in terms of dose with mindfulness? Like, is there an optimal amount or some really, like, was there anything really surprising that you found? Like, oh, wow, like if you only do it this much, we're seeing kind of this big thing. Have you found anything like that? Yes, in a, in a sense. I mean, some of these things, there, there's also a difference in mindfulness with 
with things like uh, state and trait outcomes. So normally uh, state right. means sort of what the state you're in. So, so if you might practice mindfulness and you're feeling calm, you're feeling like quite quite content in, in the moment as well, but that might not be yep. long lasting necessarily. So if you do it once, it might be, right. not, you know, be your, become a habit or something that you are content. Right, because with. traits are going to take more time, right? They've mm -hmm. got to be, they've got to be more integrated throughout your habit system. That exactly. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so that's 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 one of those differences. So so there, there's, I think in research it would be great to do like um, a measure of continues continued practice over several months mm -hmm. or, or even years or something like that. That'd be fantastic to do. But again, that yep. that's quite complicated to to do and getting people um, to come in. But I think that's definitely some options for more research there. Um, in terms of the the optimal dose, again, I think that's different uh, from from person to person. Again, and I know that's quite an annoying answer because <laughs> it'd be great to be like, oh, do these five minutes, and you you sort of that'd be great, you know, like a prescription drug or something. Um, yeah. I think I think a little bit uh -huh. in. I think that's again in psychology. Sometimes things are m much more complicated <laughs> than, than they seem, you know. Um, but I think definitely. I mean, when in my studies that I've done, the, the comparing five minutes to to 20 minutes and in like a control group who, d who just listens to something else the surprising thing yep. there was to to find five minute practices actually being more helpful for um psychological distress than the longer practices because of wow being so yeah interesting isn't it how come yeah see that's yeah. that's the thing i wanted to hear how interesting yeah. that even five minutes of practice is going to have these these important benefits and maybe even more so than the 20 minute practice with, you know, with beginning yeah. meditators who are trying to, are trying yeah. to alleviate some cognitive distress. Mm, absolutely. Is that, is that a reflection of the fact that five minutes, beyond five minutes, you start to in some how lose the effect? Or is it that people struggle with the bigger dose? I think it's more that they struggle with the bigger dose. So this, in this study, I took people who were novice mindfulness practitioners. So, so people who have not done mindfulness before, who don't have a regular mindfulness practice, right? So this is different populations. Again, they're general population adults, um, but not engaging in mindfulness practices. Um, and it was, I think that they hadn't done this before. So, so it was mindfulness of the breath meditation practice, and then they listened to an audio book. Uh, as well so it's 25 minutes in total but each one group did 20 minutes one group did five minutes five minutes and it was i think because it was this again very surprising finding because it's not what we hypothesized either so we thought oh maybe 20 minutes would be better but actually i think it's that five minutes this like a, a taster or sometimes getting used to this way of, of listening to something getting used to paying attention to your breath which which is like a learning thing people have to get into again a little bit more as well, yeah. as well. whereas 20 minutes yeah. can be quite difficult already and and people say 20 minutes is short already you know there's there's longer ones as well now i'm starting to see a little bit from what you said a little bit earlier um coming into play you're right from the five to the 20 there's lots of there's lots of confounding factors for why that might be um less beneficial like you have uh self-consciousness about your abilities to do this. You've got lots of doubt. You're new at doing this, so you don't have the skills built for it. Five minutes is easy because it's novel. 20 minutes is potentially laborious um, because it is challenging to start with. And there's a lot of misconceptions about what success is. And lots of people are either type A or recovering type A people like I am. And then we don't like to not be good at the things that we're doing. And we don't like to be confused. And we don't. And I think for a lot of people, we don't like to sit with our own um our own cognitive emotional state much you know we're doing a lot of distracting mm. in our world right now and meditation at a longer dose isn't always very comfortable and especially if you're starting to move from um states to traits and you're doing a little bit more advanced practices it stops being something i mean eventually it does bring um great comfort i think um but the middle part can be a bit rocky and so of course the higher dose is going to come with it's going to come with some of its own problems, isn't it? Yeah. That are going to be, uh, yeah, that you're not going to get maybe at five, you're not going to get at five minutes. And I think it's also, it, I mean, doses again is, is a bit of a tricky term because it's quite a medical term, but, but in um, my research, I refer to dose as not only practice, so practice is one of the things, you know, amount of practice that you do. There's also other elements, so the, the frequency, how often you practice a week, right. um, how much you recommend it to practice that can also influence how much you actually practice um you know how 
if it's a group practice, if, if it's a self-help practice, there's all these different areas that also influence. So if you have a, um, a teacher, a qualified teacher, that might be quite different. You know, maybe if you had a qualified teacher, you can check in with afterwards. If you do it in a group, that might again be different. So there's lots of different elements affecting this, this sort of dose-response dose relationship uh, as well. Anything you found in that, in that uh, part that was interesting or surprising? I mean, in addition to just the length of the sit, but also frequency and suggested frequency and having a teacher that's there to like check in regularly, anything there? Pop out? Yeah, so one I did in a, in a first, before I did the, the length of practice uh, um, study, I did a, a large uh, meta regression meta analysis, which is basically like a review of lots of different studies that have already done mindfulness programs right. and what they found. And basically, um, for those programs, so there's, there's over 200 studies, so lots and lots of different doses of mindfulness. Um, and what I found actually for increasing trait mindfulness after a program, more intense programs were more helpful. So actually having right. great, um, more intense programs, so more sessions a week and also more contact with a facilitator that was um, predicted greater levels of trait mindfulness at the end. So for right. that outcome, not for depression, anxiety and stress, but for that outcome, no. more intense sessions and more contact was found more helpful, which makes sense because mindfulness, yeah, of um, course. again, being a skill that's learned. So if you've got someone directly teaching you, it might be more helpful than doing it online. Again, yep. more research needs to be done though because that's not a, a study, but that was what, what other yeah. people have said in, in the realm. So. That's interesting then, because it raises the question, why didn't it, in the same vein, help more with the depression, anxiety outcomes? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think it's slightly different. There, there might also be, I mean, there, there's a few factors. So a lot of the time in the, um, in the studies, people hadn't done much mindfulness before. So they had quite you know limited knowledge of mindfulness at the beginning um not having done it before and there was much more scope to increase that you know whereas yeah, um, you know right. someone who's not done it where someone who's, who's already got quite a high baseline level of mindfulness um on the other yeah. hand as well sometimes um people weren't necessarily clinical samples as well so that means that they might have you know low levels of depression anxiety and, and stress to start with and high doses might not have changed that so much um, and low doses might have been more helpful. Other things that I found as well is um, recommended practices actually, greater recommended practices actually were found to have higher levels of anxiety and depression at follow-up. So sometimes it's, it's one to four months follow-up uh, as well, which was interesting. But I'm thinking about, but it's again difficult because we don't know what happens between the post program and the follow up for these studies. So they, they didn't check in or, or, or see how much people actually practiced in that period. But it could be that people that were recommended to practice for longer, maybe the 40 minutes, maybe up to an hour a day, they might have found that too challenging to keep up with, you know, in their everyday life away from the, from yeah. the group. Um, whereas people yeah. who were told maybe do five or 10 minutes, they might have continued with that. Um, but that's a, a theory. We don't know if that's what people did, but it would make sense, you know, that. that yeah. Happened. You know, this is just a totally personal opinion here, but um, um, I struggle, I struggle with feeling comfortable with those sorts of programs where you train somebody up to be doing an hour, an hour of this emotional, cognitive, introspective, metacognitive training a day, and then you leave them without having a regular teacher that can come back into contact with them to tell them how it progresses when you do. Because an hour is actually, uh, that's, a, that's a fairly big dose. And you're gonna have real, I think, given enough time, if you're doing that on your own, you're gonna have some real changes in the way that you see yourself and the way that you see your thoughts and the way that you see the world. And so, you know, to train, I mean, the five and 10, you're probably in a very safe window to say now, you know, on your own now, yeah. spend five minutes a day doing your cognitive hygiene, um, 15 minutes a day doing cognitive hygiene, doing eight minutes a day of loving kindness. I mean, I can basically see no, I can see no problem with that. Yeah. But, you know, training somebody up to an hour and then saying, good luck. Mm, um, and then who knows, because that changes, right? Like if you're practicing an hour a day, lots of things can change. And if you're making even a slight uh, miss, you know, then that can elaborate mm. issues over time. I mean, for instance, like people who think, that if the mind is moving, then you're failing. Yeah. When in fact, the moving mind isn't a problem at all. The mind always moves. That's just natural for the mind to move. Rather, you want to become cool 
with the mind moving in all of its different ways. But lots of people miss that point. I find when I give that talk, and I seem to be giving that talk a lot, people are like, oh, I had no idea. Yeah. I thought I was just bad at meditation because my mind moved around, and um, this is, um, rather than meditation all being about getting a good relationship with your moving mind. Mm, absolutely, I agree. And I think this is, again, where the practicality issue comes in. Because I know that some courses, so, so Bruno Kayun from Tasmania in Australia, for instance, um, he does the uh, MICBT course. And I know he does some um, work, yeah. work with him on the project, but but he does like these drop in sessions, right? For people who have completed this course, um, and then he does sort of regular drop in sessions in a group where people yeah. can ask questions. Like this happened to me. I'm unsure. Lovely, about it, and and things like that. That's you know that's that's really helpful, and and that's where I think longer practices have been found really helpful. The problem is, yeah. I think as well, practically, not everyone can do that as well. So someone who maybe did an online course um, or did. Yeah did an app-based course or something like that, yeah. there might be less uh, help there. So for, for these people, for instance, it might be helpful to do the five, 10 minutes and it, it might still help them with, with their everyday yeah. life. They might not be able to go as deep, obviously, obviously not um, as, as someone who practices for longer um, amounts of yeah. time, but it might still yeah. help them. And that's where the practicality of things comes in, where, where things are being made accessible and not, not just for people who are able to go to a course or, or attend um, attend these courses um, and and do and have the time to do that as well, um, yeah. which I think is really important. The other thing where the word dose is interesting is you know it's medical, but it often refers to medicine. And with medicine, you have one variable, which is how much you're taking, but you also have the frequency of taking. And you know, compared to Mark or the one hour you mentioned, well, that's twelve doses of five minutes. But it seems to me that if you spent one hour on day one doing an hour versus 12 days in a row of five minutes, it seems like you're doing quite a different activity there as far as the brain is concerned. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering whether that came through in your research. Yeah, so that's a different that, that's a difference there. So you've got the dose of a single practice and then you've got the dose of the total practices that you do. So for instance, as well, if you sometimes someone who does five minutes but does that more regularly might end up with more at the end you know, quantity wise than someone who does an, an hour once and then nothing afterwards. So for mindfulness, I think um, generally regularity is more important than doing something once and then nothing for the rest of the time as well. Um, so, so it's all about training your mind, getting your mind used to things um, and then doing, doing these informal mindfulness practices that I mentioned as well, sort of, you know, being more mindful in, in everyday life as well. Is, is more helpful than, than sort of just doing the one long practice and then not Yeah, it. right, because there's an analogy here, isn't there, with the leaking bucket. Yes. And the mindfulness is great, but the dose of the formal practice must be sort of supported by the dose of the everyday practice, which I think people can quite typically find easier. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's, that's again, where, where it's slightly different from, from medicine, maybe, if you... I'm, I'm not a... A medical doctor or anything but if someone had maybe an allergic reaction you give give them an epipen and they're fine you know sort of thing um and then that's that's done um until the next allergic reaction maybe but in in psychology i think our minds are much more complex it's like there's a lot of stress going on all the time um and and unfortunately that's just how it is it's not going to go away because we did a mindfulness practice once you know there's going to be more and sort of training your mind to become as you say the stress bucket as well so keeping that keeping that low because there'll be more things coming in but sort of being able to to work with that being able to feel less anxious less worried about things but being in in the present moment as well uh, not worrying about the past ruminating about the past and not uh, worrying about future things what's going to happen next because that's all the things that then fill fill the stress bucket as well yeah and there's also i mean just this conversation is bringing out for me how many different uses of mindfulness there really are because you really can use mindfulness as an attempt to blow up your initial perceptions of what it is to be a self and a human being on this planet. Mm. But you can also use it to help you manage your day. And it seems that dose, we never speak about this enough, how linked dose actually in fact is to your specific outcome you have in mind. And probably as a result, the importance of clarifying your outcome. Yes. Yeah, so no wonder we're running into, some people are running into trouble, right? Because... You're not thinking about dose. Well, maybe you're not. You're maybe you're not thinking clearly about dose, Jamie. I mean, you're exactly right. You know, like p figure out what your goal is 
for, for practicing in these ways and then consider the right dose. Consider where you are on the training program. Remember that it is a training. I mean, Sarah, I mean, you just keep saying it again and I hear it again and again as you say, mind training, mind training. And it is a training. You're going to a sort of mental gym here and you're training something. So to get clear about what your goal is and to get clear about where you are and then to select the right dose and to remember that the dose is gonna change depending on what you're trying to develop and where you are in your training cycle. I mean, that even happens for athletes, right? Mm. Some days you train harder, some days you train weaker. And for a good athlete, you're gonna know when the big days are, when the high load days are, and when the low load days are. But I don't hear, and I would love to hear more of this because I definitely practice like this. I don't hear a lot of people talking about this manual adjusting for optimal outcomes, but we could be, we could maybe be think, thinking about that yeah. like that. And I think again, that's, that's um, it's interesting what you, you said, Jamie, as well, and, and, and Mark, looking at what is, what is it that you want trying to, uh, to find out as well. So another analogy that I use sometimes, because I, I like analogies, it's nice. Um, it's yeah, like someone, exactly. You know, it's like someone, <laughs> if you're trying to learn a language, right? Say like someone wants to learn Italian uh, because they want to go on holiday and, and order an ice cream or something like that, right? So that you, you've got that level of this is my goal. That's what I want to do. I want to go to Italy, order an ice cream or something. But if someone wants to like go to Italy, go to university, you know, do intellectual conversations with Italian Read Dante you know, read in Dante, the original. Things like that. Yeah. Exactly. That might be a different goal. And then you might need to adjust yeah. the amount of practice that you do, Italian learning practice. Similarly, yeah, so, that might be, might be similar in mindfulness as well. Yeah, exactly. So you want to, so you've got a little bit of pain. Uh, like my mom was just dealing with hip pain and she did the Headspace app on pain, which I think Headspace is just such a great way to like, you know, it's such a soft edged way of doing uh, meditation, I think, because you know, it's very short, they're low doses. And she did the pain course and she had a real, she had real epiphany, you know, she started looking at her pain a couple minutes a day, actually changed her relationship with her pain and really oh, had a different right. experience of her relationship with pain. She doesn't need to do more than that. That's all she wanted out of it. She wanted to, well, she's got in a little bit of persistent low grade pain. She mm -hmm. just wanted to work a little bit with her own appreciation, her own approach to pain. And so a very low dose over a very low amount of frequency over a short period of time was all she needed to kind of get the habit of being like, oh, I'm in a bit of pain. Wait, let me take a look at it rather than turning away from it. And wow, look, like it is just sort of signals in the body rather than being something totally weird. And look, I feel good in all of these other places, even though I have a little pain here. She was able to pick that up in low doses, low set, um, but that was it. So if you're coming at contemplative training thinking, oh, I just like to get a better relationship with my pain, but then you're listening to a teacher who's like an hour a day is what you need from now on. Um, you might have your wires crossed there because yeah. the teacher might not be talking about a small update and how you understand your pain. They might be like, yeah, if you really want to get on this path and you really want to see transformative, you know, awakened states start to emerge, then this is what you need to be doing. But you got to be really clear there because yeah. those are very different. And I think I think that's fantastic. It's great that um, that worked for your mom as well. And it's not to say yeah. that um, longer mindfulness practices aren't helpful. There's lots of research saying that the high doses are really, really helpful um, for right. people as well. So I think it's just that it's one of those things where more than one thing can be true. You know, like low sure. doses can be helpful for, for someone like your mom with, with pain management or um, higher doses can be really helpful for, for other people who want to get more emerged um, towards towards that. And I think there's... There's also individual differences there for what people want and also what helps people um, to get started with, to continue with um, higher doses. You know, I think, I think it's great to have a variety of different things. I think that that's good. You know? Yeah, so just one thing I want to just pull out there and say out loud because I think it's important and it comes up now, but just um, how good it is for us as a contemplative community because most people who are coming on the show are also people who are doing these practices and I definitely am to remember that like, just like with medicine and just like exercise, being mindful of what you're after and being mindful of the outcomes and then adjusting the dose relative to those things seems like a really, um, a really wholesome and a really protective, a really protective practice, you know, cause then you can watch and you can monitor, oh, that's not quite enough, let's lift it up. Oh, that, that seems to be a little bit too much stress and strain let's lower it down. And you would do that with medication as well. And you would do it with exercise prescription as well. You know, my wife is a physio and she's all the time toggling people's exercise regimes based on the outcomes. And though you don't know the outcomes at first, you have to be like, how is it going? Yeah. Oh, it's going good. Great. Then, you know, keep going or it's not going well, then let's adjust. And maybe if we could 
think about our contemplative training programs like that. I think that would be beneficial. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, something else that's just emerging here too is Mark, you said your mum kind of learnt the technique and now can apply that. So she heard the clip, did the practice, and now that same practice can be applied. And there's effectively two things happening here, right? One is you can learn a technique. Now, part of that is doing it and part of it is like, this is the thing you do, like an instruction. Right. And that's a slightly different thing to your brain needs to change by doing the repetition of mindfulness. And it seems like a lot of the benefits of mindfulness takes that instructive element. Like you just need to nail the first bit, try it a few times, and now that's in the locker. And it seems like that would be a very good reason why low doses are effective because you can carry the lessons forward. And similarly, I think as well with, that's a really good point that, that you make it there. I think it's, it's also um, about in, instructed sort of guided practices. So a lot of the time, um, earlier on, people have guided practices. So someone saying, you know, reminding people to you know concentrate on their breath in, in apps they do that a lot like headspace inside time i come all those um sort of guided practices but a lot of the time people who are more experienced meditators they have less guided practices as well where that skill element comes in so it's it's like learning that skill knowing what to do um first in and i think that's that's where it's again similar to other skills that you might be learning you know maybe learning a language these skills like that later on you don't need to um go on a you know on your facebook or, or whatever it is you're looking at yeah um and yeah. i think that's that's the same with with that and i think often um with mindfulness because it's it's a different way it can be helpful to start small um and start at, at like oh okay this is a different thing i'm doing now um, rather than starting with long practices which 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 does help for some people but i think for others as well it can be quite tricky and um, just just getting used to things slowly um, because your mum might have I don't know I'm, I'm assuming if someone said oh sit down and do an hour and a half of this practice she no. might have been like no no, no it would it would have <laughs> much worse outcomes it would have totally worse outcomes of course it would have had worse outcomes or absolutely she might not have done it at all you know that's no, a lot of the things that sure. we see as well no. um, and I think there's, exactly there's right. a lot of assumptions as well with with mindfulness um, coming you know contemplative practices as well that you need to have some sort of baseline skills to be able to do that. You need to be a certain calm person. You need to be able to sit cross-legged, all these other things, which is not true, which yeah. you, not, you don't no. have to do. But I think sometimes yeah. there's these assumptions of what, what you need to be able to do in order to get the benefits, in order to, to have some, something helpful coming from it as well. Sarah, is this, um, is this interest in dose and mindfulness, is this still on your radar for future research? Are you mm. brewing anything now for new studies that are going to be coming out? Or what's the sort of next big question in this chain? I think there's, there's a lot more to do in, in the um, dose, dose research. So there's a lot more um, questions that haven't been answered yet. I mean, I mean it's, it's interesting that there's been so much research on, on the different doses, but no one's looked at, hang on, what's the mechanisms or or not many people have looked right. at the mechanisms. And there's a lot more um, to look into, you know, you know, looking at the whole group versus individuals, what, what is the difference there? So, so if your mum had done um, a group um, mindfulness practice, would 20 minutes have been more helpful? You know, what would have been, what, what is the, the thing there? Um, also the different types of practice potentially um, that could be mm. helpful. So a lot of the time things like a, a mindfulness of the breath meditation practice is quite a standard one that is used quite a lot just because the breath is readily available you don't ne need anything else you've got it already right um but then there's other types of practices um you talked about loving kindness practices that are slightly different practice um all these different types of practices and how how they're different uh, there's also been a yeah. lot of research looking at mindful inductions and um, so this is mindfulness uh, or studies that are a single mindfulness practice and you see what the state outcomes are. So after a 10 minute practice, what is the outcome, for instance, or a 15 minute practice? Um, then that obviously can't see what the long term, you know, practices are. This, you know, is just having a look at what happens after one practice for these outcomes as well. Um, and also looking at other outcomes. So I've done a, a study as well on positive psychological outcomes. For instance, are people more <coughs> hopeful after a mindfulness practice? Or um, what is gratitude? Gratitude is quite an interesting one as well. So um, do yeah. people feel more grateful after a mindfulness practice? Because that's been linked to increased well-being outcomes as well. So there's a lot of different ones. I think also with the 
a pandemic having so many things online you know there's a difference with online mindfulness programs there's a lot more things to to understand i think so there's a lot more um i'd like to find out about those i think yeah. yeah. And the hope and gratitude bit there, is that evidence you already have back or is that something you're still, that's still in the cooker? Yeah. So that's a, um, a paper I, I, I was published, I think in January this year. So it's a, a mindfulness induction randomized control trial where we had two groups. So one group um, did a mindfulness practice. The other group listened to something, uh, the history of the universe, you know, something, something completely different. Um, nice. And then having a look, also interesting, I think, but different <laughs> no instructions there yeah. um but then looking at yeah but after a, a single mindfulness practice what is the difference in state hope and state gratitude outcomes um having a and what do you find so there's increased um levels of state gratitude and and state hope also mediated by by state mindfulness so individuals that had a greater change in state mindfulness so they're feeling uh in the moment they're feeling greater mindfulness um, that that also meant they had greater levels of gratitude and greater levels of hope as well. So there's a relationship there. Lovely. Um, and, and how and how long was the, how big was the dose? So that was a ten minute practice, a single ten minute yeah. practice as well. So quite interesting. For that. was it frequency or just one practice? Just one practice. So that's a mind, mindfulness induction, which is just one practice uh, to see what the mechanisms are more so than long term changes. Um, but they Got can it. inform these long term changes as well. Got it. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, there's a but there's also a practical edge here, right? Because mm. for meditators onto both ends of the objective spectrum, on the one hand, I just want to improve my life a little bit. And on the other, I'm a, ser a serious practitioner. Dose is important and dose is something you actually wrestle with without realizing you're wrestling with every time you make a decision to practice. Mm. So my first question is, what is your what is the practical edge to this advice or of this research for beginners? So that's, um, I think that's a that's a great, great question because I think a lot of the time as a as an academic or scientist, uh, we answer all of these questions. We've got all of these things that we want to find out, and then we find them out, and then we publish them, and then it doesn't really reach outside of academia, or sometimes it does. Um, so I think that's mm. one of the the important things, especially with things like well being um, outcomes or, or things that people can to can do to help with their well being or improve their lives and. And something that they might find helpful for pain management like like your mum or um you know people being stressed and having lots to do um and um something that can help not that it is a panacea because that's the the other end of the extreme because that that's quite dangerous as well mindfulness is seen as like the cure for everything yeah um yeah but, definitely but i think definitely there is something that can be helpful in in this practical side of things that you can do brief mindfulness practices you can build these up maybe have these regularly um, and then it can help you in your in your effort everyday life it can help you not everyone as well so some people might mm. not find it helpful and that's fine as well they might find you yeah. know going for a walk more helpful or exercising yeah. Or whatever yeah and what about those who are on sort of the deep end of the spectrum and consider themselves fairly serious practitioners mm. i think um that's another thing that I'm looking at at the moment at, at looking at experienced meditators and how that looks w differently to, to novice me meditators or non-meditators because I think that would be something really interesting to explore further as well. So I've done quite a bit of research with these novice meditators who, you know, limited previous experience of mindfulness, haven't done much of it. But I'd also like to look into more what motivates someone to go further. You know, what is, uh, is there an element of individual differences? What makes someone want to... Uh, sit down and practice maybe for an hour or two hours or go on these longer retreats um, as well so what what is the mechanism there and how how do they find it helpful um also if they didn't do that how would it impact their their lives you know what would the difference be if they stopped practicing mindfulness um that's quite a difficult thing to research though because you don't want to tell people not to do something that they find helpful you know <laughs> again yeah. that's, that's quite yeah. tricky uh, to, to do. we'd like you to sit on the couch now for a month <laughs> and uh, just watch netflix yeah. <laughs> don't exercise and exactly. we want to see what happens <laughs> yeah exactly but, um, yeah. but um, <laughs> on both of those ends i think there are so many questions to to be answered what motivates someone to do that what is their practice why did it change why did they start practicing why did they increase the practice um if they did um what what is the most benefit that they find out about that and and i think there's a lot of a lot of areas there to explore as well which would be great mm. 
Sarah, thank you so much for coming on. Where can everybody find you online? Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. I've got a, a few things. You can find me on Twitter at, at Sarah Stromeyer. I also have a website, which is sarahpsychology.com, which might be easier to spell uh, than my surname. <laughs> and, um, otherwise, I think I can give you the links for, for my uh, LinkedIn or my uh, research gate for those um, academics who want to find out more about my research as well. Um, but yeah, otherwise, those Twitter or, or website would be good. Um, Sarah, thanks so much for coming on. And everyone, thank you for listening, wherever you are. Um, this has been the Contemplative Science Podcast. And as always, we will see you next week.